Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, it's a picture of uh, City Hall in Carmel, Indiana. It was a building built in the 1980s. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the city and a little bit about the history of cities in the United States. I was, well, here, this is always fun. Uh, one of the more famous magazines in the state is CNN's Money Magazine. And every two years, they, uh, they uh, look at cities between 50,000 and 300,000, medium-sized cities, and name, um, there's, there's uh, about 780 of them, and they name what they think is the best one based on a series of data. And they named us the uh, best place to live in the United States. Um, that's always good as a mayor, you know, that's, that helps, especially right before an election. Um, we are located in the middle of the country, in the state of Indiana. Uh, Indianapolis is the capital and the largest city. It's a metropolitan area of two million people. Uh, when I became mayor, Carmel was about 25,000 people. Today, it's just under 100,000 people as the largest suburb to Indianapolis. Um, there we are. So, this is not Carmel. <laughs> Actually happens to be San Diego, California. It's always, always about 20 degrees, 19 degrees, blue skies, uh, rarely rains, mountains in the background, sailboats, sunny every day. This, too, is not Carmel, Indiana. That actually happens to be Aspen in Colorado. Mountains, beautiful. That's not Carmel. No, <laughs> it looks like it. This, on the other hand, is what we have to work with. It's our palette. It's what we have to build our new city with. Flat, lousy weather most of the time. The summer's much like today. Um, too hot, winter's cold, we do get snow. May and September are nice. <laughs> no rivers and no mountains. No ocean. We have Lake Michigan, which is essentially an ocean about two hours away. On the other hand, the folks that live in this city, the people that live in this city had a similar set of uh, restrictions. Not that great of weather, little small river through the middle of it, it's usually kind of greenish brown, uh, no mountains, and no ocean. So I try to inspire the people in our city. They have the same set of conditions we did, and they've done okay. They, they, they built a nice city. Uh, I ran, I stood for mayor for the first time in May of 1995. I was unknown, and so I knocked on thousands of doors, and I heard the same thing from people over and over and over, and it was, I wish there was some place I could walk for a dinner and a show without having to get into my car. Some of it may have been motivated by I don't want to risk the police when I drive home after a couple of drinks, but uh, I wish there was a downtown to take visitors to. I wish I could ride my bicycle somewhere I want to go because our roads had no bike lanes, um, riding on narrow sidewalks. Um, so we set out to say, how do we build a really competitive city? Remember, we don't have these natural amenities, so we've got to work on the built environment. So the first thing we did, and we have uh, 50 square miles. Uh, I can't do that in the hectares. That would be um, a big area, twice the size of the island of Manhattan in New York. That was the size of our city. Um, with, with only about 25,000 people, very spread out. So we started with that little village area that had more or less been abandoned. But we had a huge investment in our government-supported or public school in the area, hundreds of millions of dollars in these, uh, the big high school, junior highs. And it was important that area not fall anymore into disrepair. So it's very hard to redevelopment under our laws in the states. Going out and tearing up a green field is much easier. It's easier for the bank that lends the money to the developer. It's easier for the developer more land to work with. You have smaller cut up pieces of property in the, uh, in the older areas. So we took this area, and these are the pictures you're looking at. We uh, added a roundabout before you get to the area as much as anything to calm and slow the high speed traffic before you got to a pedestrian area. We, um, Oh, there it is. 
That was the first public-private partnership. We entered into the our Redevelopment Commission and bought the land. It's unusual in the United States for government to get actively involved in the uh, redevelopment of an area um, traditionally. Traditionally, that's been the case uh, as we move forward more and more, but it really takes this partnership. So we bought that land, and that was a big parking lot, some small one-story buildings. And you can see we required the developer, moved it up to the street. Uh, we added the street trees, the uh, lighting, the flower baskets, um, the human scale. It's a three-story building, two levels of uh, homes or flats and retail on the bottom and just put the parking in back of the building. But that was our first step. That was our first building in this uh, suburban area. Um, that was the main corner. That was the building on the main corner of the old village. Isn't it beautiful? They usually sold used furniture. I think I remember we needed to take the before picture the day they were moving out, hence the truck. Usually they had old furniture sitting out on the lawn, you know, $8 couch and the mice came with it. Uh, we replaced it with this uh, series of buildings a developer did for us and so that the average person, the average smaller business owner had the opportunity to, uh, to profit from the revitalization of this area, just not the large development corporations. We required the developer to sell each of those storefronts, all three levels, uh, to 80 percent of them had to be sold to small businesses. Um, there, there's buildings, uh, the two projects from a different view. You start to see that a streetscape's being developed. Um, there was an old uh, rail corridor that had been abandoned in the 1970s that ran from our area to downtown Indianapolis and also all the way to Chicago. It originally been put in to take most of the U.S.'s rail lines run east to west. This one goes north to south, but it had been put in during the Civil War to actually take supplies to the northern troops fighting uh, against the rebels in the south. The um, and so it had been abandoned. Of course, we, we follow the English common law, as most states do, all but one in the United States. And so we had the power of eminent domain to get that back and turn it into a bike trail, a bike road. Um, we had to file an eminent domain or condemnation lawsuit against 246 separate owners. Because for the lawyers in the room, it's what's called a reversionary deed. When the deed for which the purpose the land was originally deeded for it goes away, it reverts back, that parcel of land reverts back and reattaches to the parcel from which it was originally broken off for the rail line. So we had all these homeowners now. Um, but we were able to do that. You can imagine as a mayor f filing suit against 246 of your citizens is always a good idea <laughs> to take their backyards um, for a bike trail. I actually had one fellow, oh, we had lots of fun meetings on that. I had one fellow tell me once the freight trains that carried freight were much better in his backyard than bikers, um, <laughs> bicyclists. Um, here you see on the left the edge of a building that was just finished. That uh, was our most recent project in this area. You start to see, I wish I had better before pictures, but this was basically a series of small one-story buildings gravel, unpaved parking lots, an old farming village. It now uh, has an urban uh, streetscape to it. I had a lot of pressure to push the buildings back from the street. And we looked at you know, folks that hadn't had the opportunity to maybe travel on the earth from more, tra more traditional cities, and we fought hard to say, no, we need to keep the street small to, create the, uh, to get the massing right. Um, one of the things I instituted, we started to spend 2%, initially 1%, now 2% of our revenues uh, for the arts. And part of that money was used to bring in public art in this two-block area. This is one famous U.S. artist uh, named Seward Johnson. Uh, he has a series. We, we put the violinist, the street musician, in front of a music store. Have a lot of fun with it. But we uh, bought 18 of his pieces. So there's, in essence, a walk, an outdoor walking exhibition. And now we're starting to add other artists as well. But it's their bronzes that he actually paints them. Um, and uh, it's meant to represent life in the U.S. in the 1970s. You look at the picture in the top left, you'll start to see some umbrellas. And this was a change. Over the last three or four years, we started to uh, do away with parking spaces along that street. 
occasionally, mix it up a little bit and push the sidewalk out and then allow in front of restaurants and then allow the restaurant owner to uh, serve in that area. Again, cutting, you know, putting the street on a diet, the vehicular street, widening the sidewalks. Um, see the brick building? Uh, that was the first uh, condominium building to be built in the area, opened about eight years ago. Um, art gallery on the first two floors and for some very nice condominiums on the uh, or own flats on the uh, top two floors there there's some republic art we had a lot of fun with it the um we put the nurse that you know that iconic photo that was in the front page of the new york times at the end of uh on victory in japan day in 1945 the uh yeah uh we put the uh, nurse kissing the sailor in front of the lingerie shop, and the woman that runs that shop says that there's at least some World War II vets or people of that era in their 90s stop by almost daily and try to recreate the pose and have her come out and take a picture of them. So we, we looked for art that people would interact with, both kids and, and you know, all the way up to people in their 90s. Have fun with that one. Um, we think, you know, community events. We've kept this small green space in the middle where there's a lot of concerts um, right along the trail. This was another site, a before site, right about two blocks away. Um, you know, a grocery store that become a liquor store, an empty building next to it, beautiful parking lot in front. Um, we turned it into that. The city bought the land again, allowed the taxes from the construction of that building that they'll pay to be used to pay for underground parking. Which generally, it's going to be uneconomical because land is still so inexpensive in our part of the country. So it's a bit of a political sell to get that done. I'd point out that we get more property tax if you go up higher, and you're only allowed to do that if you get the cars underground. Eventually, we'll create a large enough area where people don't need a car, but there's this transition period where people will still drive cars. Uh, we've talked to a few families now that have have uh, dispensed of, they used to have two or three cars, and now they may have one uh, in this area. One spouse will need the car to go to work, but another one works in the area, and they're walking. So for a suburb in the middle part of the United States, that's a huge improvement. Uh, this is a design center. You drive in the, those entryways and then go into an underground garage. It has, a, has I think, 60-some stores, uh, all associated with the design industry. If you're building a new house or remodeling a house or a business, everything's under one roof. Uh, there's the original building that we did. That's uh, the old warehouse as it went down and where the crane is sitting. That was just a parking lot. And again, that's uh, what we have today. Um, That was what we call the art and design district. We turned it into an area focused on galleries, design, restaurants, um, a lot of festivals in it, but it's small. It's only four blocks long. It was the original village. Remember, our land area is twice the size of the island of Manhattan, 48 square miles. So we went four blocks away where we had this beautiful big box store, um, and the city bought 88 acres and master plan our new downtown. Uh, to date, about a billion and a half dollars has been dedicated to that project, both public and private money. Uh, and this is very unusual for a, a car suburb in the United States. That's a former grocery store. They had built a bigger big box across the street and left that for us. Um, so that was the first piece of property. Up at the top, you see one of the, uh, that was about four, we started, we announced that project my second year as mayor in, uh, remember the date, May 15th of 1997. The picture in the top left's from about 2000 as the master plan starting together. And the picture below um, is, um, is from last year. And you can see uh, starting to come together, the anchor for this area is a concert hall. We looked around the two million person metro area um, of Indianapolis and realized that uh, while well, Indianapolis had several good theaters, uh, did Broadway shows, smaller theater, it didn't have a purpose-built concert hall. It had a con converted vaudeville theater the Indianapolis Symphony was playing in. There were lots and lots of other symphonies and, uh, that had no home, no place to play. 
And uh, so we built uh, the building you see on the left, which was inspired by Palladio's Villa Rotenda in Vicenza, outside of Venice, built in the 1530s. We, we received some criticism for looking to the past, not to the future with a contemporary building, but we knew it was timeless. We needed a four-sided building. Uh, David Schwarz of Washington, D.C. was a design architect, and we matched him with a local firm. I'll talk more about that building earlier. Later, it was $125 million just for the concert hall. And then the building across from it to the right, I have better pictures of it, but it hides a parking structure. We put a parking garage in of five stories because the water table is too high to go under right there. Um, but then totally surrounded that building with housing and stores and, and the offices and two small theaters. Um, there's the front of our city center, the highest point is the eight-story tower you see. Um, it's a mix of office, retail on the ground floor, um, and uh, houses, both owner-occupied and rental flats or apartments. Here we had no water, so we built that big reflecting pool you see on the bottom left. Uh, we put up a memorial to our veterans. Um, those are three-story flats that surround it, as well as some offices. There's other pictures you'll see. There it is. You see the uh, reflecting pool in front of the apartment building. Uh, you'll see the trail running through the city center in the top left. Uh, that's the bike trail. It's limited to bikers and, or cyclists and walkers. And we're getting ready yeah, to expand it because it's not wide enough. We have electronic counters. We're up to 12,000 people a day on the trail. Friend, this is a city of 100,000. As a suburban uh, city. Uh, we're trying to create piazzas. We're looking back, again, because of the unique circumstances of the 20th century, the invention of the car, all the changes, we threw out thousands of years of experience, a city planning experience. We said, we need to look to Europe. You know, I, I asked my American audiences, when I'm talking about these things. So how many of you have been to Europe? And usually, if it's a well-to-do group of people, you know, two-thirds to 80% of the people raise their hands. And I ask them, what's the first thing they do in Europe? And we're all thinking the same thing. We find a nice side sidewalk cafe, have a drink, and enjoy the surroundings, and people watch in this beautiful old city, whichever city in Europe it happens to be. And I point that out. And I said, doesn't that beg the question, why can't we build cities like this in our new suburbs? And people think about it, but rarely does it happen. So we're, we're looking at piazzas, uh, small squares. We've used uh, Suzanne's book, The Genius of the European Public Square, and others to, uh, to, uh, to guide us. Uh, but as we add, have this increased density in the center of the sprawling suburb, we need to pay a lot more attention to the details. So we make the streets out of brick and masonry, pay a lot of attention to architectural detail, pay a lot of attention to where the sun hits the piazzas and the plazas, all sorts of things that American architects generally have not been required to pay too much attention to or have chosen not to because they have so much space to work in. Um, there again, you see how we've brought the buildings up to the street. So, row of townhomes doesn't seem out of the ordinary, except we were not aware of any other projects in medium sized cities in the middle part of the United States where that had been done when we did it in 2000. Townhomes weren't built, and they certainly weren't built up on the street. Maybe some in Chicago, but that was it from the East Coast, probably all the way to the West Coast. It just wasn't done. And we, of course, have rear entry for the cars, move them up to the streets. Uh, we used a lot of Georgian architecture because of the historical aspect of it in the United States. It was what was popular at the time of our war for independence from England. Um, and people were used to it because a lot of it's been, a lot of bad Georgians been built, but we tried to make sure the architects paid attention to the scale, got it right. Uh, these are office buildings. You can see how we uh, got the cars. Just a little bit of teasing parker and f teasing parking scattered around, but most of it's put underground. And this is an important, you know, I live in a very conservative area, financially at least, and I had to explain to people, why would you help these private companies out? So I point out, this is a site that normally would be a 20,000 square foot building. Let's assume 
that we get one dollar per square foot of property tax. So one building surrounded by a big parking lot, twenty thousand dollars a year. I said, okay, developer, you can use the taxes for the next twenty-five years to build the parking, but you have to put it underground. What do we get now? We get five buildings, twenty thousand square foot buildings, five times the revenue five times the sales tax, if people are living in them, five times the income tax, the people that live there, and when that loan for the underground parking is paid off, five times the property tax. And so we work out option A or option B, and by the way, the better option looks more beautiful, it is dense enough to support the retail shops, and people start to understand it. Oh, there's our concert hall. You see the Villa Rotona in Vicenza up in the upper left? The interior of our hall, see it's not a theater, it's, it's one room construction. Uh, we tried to make it beautiful. I have a strong belief that public architecture ought to inspire and motivate people, make them proud of their community, a place to show visitors uh, and express, uh, in essence, the community's living room. Um, for many years in the United States, it was traditional in all these small towns. Remember when we had telephone books? Do we even have telephone books anymore? I don't think so. Uh, but we had telephone books. When I hired, was interviewing different architects, I went into Schwarz's office, and instead of all the normal big trophies and awards and brass plaques on the wall, he had a series of framed telephone book covers because each community in which he had worked, the buildings he had designed, had been the buildings the community loved so much they. That's what they put on the front page of their phone book. And I thought that, I like that. The concert hall is made out of Indiana stone. Indiana is famous for its limestone. Southern Indiana, most of the uh, buildings in Washington, D.C., in fact, are made out of Indiana limestone. Um, the tile, had, because we're in a, an area that freezes regularly and then thaws in the daytime, had to be a special tile that could move as it expands and contracts. Um, but it came from very close by in Ohio, about an hour away. Um, the plaster, all the interior was done by local craftsmen. And of course, we built a farmer's market green out in front of it, uh, built in small bollards with uh, water and electricity. And each Saturday, there's about four to 5,000 people come to our market. You can see it on a Saturday. We have a small amphitheater. There's always music when the market's open. Uh, so that on the left became what we have on the right. Uh, there's pictures of the size of the street. You get a size of the massing. And you see the attention, I think, in that picture to detail. Um, we have just approved another parking structure, which will support the next 10 buildings in the initial city center plan and finish it out over the next two years. There's one of the planning documents. You see the green in the middle, that's the farmer's market green, then the reflecting pool off to the left. Um, I don't have a pointer, but directly south of the green, you'll see uh, something that looks like it's marked with cars. That's the building that's entirely surrounded with, uh, built uh, uh, on three sides at least, surrounded uh, by building to hide the parking. And you'll see on the right where it says the mess, um, that's the, uh, bike, the, the bike street, the bike trail. And those apartments, uh, you can walk out your front door and be on the bike trail in about eight feet. It's right on it. And again, that's unique in our part of the United States. There's some of the pictures y uh, yet to come. We've superimposed the next set of buildings that will actually be started this fall. The building with the pillars in the middle. The building in the far left at the top was just completed. And of course, you recognize the picture in the far right. Um, that's that's the new hotel that's going to be built. Um, that's a row of buildings, everything but the building on the far right on the bottom is already there. You can see that one was superimposed into the picture. Those are office buildings. That's how we're designing the final parking structure in the development. We've wrapped it with small retail. The first thing the developer said to me, we, we lose parking spaces. I said, that's okay. Someday we're going to be doing away with these garages. We'll be turning them into to offices as the area expands and we have fewer people driving. Um, so from 
I think it was Jeff Speck that said in his book, you have to not only walk, but make it an interesting walk. And I was walking over here on the way over to Red Cliff last night and walked past a big parking structure. Where's George? Past a long parking in where there had been street life in the block before I got to this parking car park. Then the block with the car park was absolutely empty of people, devoid of people. Then you got to the next block with retail shops and restaurants. People suddenly appeared again. Uh, so we wanted to avoid that, and so we wrapped the bottom with retail. There's our trail. We try to keep it a green canopy in, uh, in, the, in the middle of the city, uh, urban oasis, uh, so to speak. Uh, we just added a bike share system. It's all done with your mobile phone. Uh, in fact, we were worried about, in fact, working for us is the, the second mayor of Carmel. We, we weren't, didn't become a city until 1976, and our friend Jane Ryman was mayor from 80 to 88. She's about 86 years old now and comes in and helps uh, my mayor's advisory youth council and answers the phone in our community relations department a couple days a week uh, as a part-time job. And she said, you know, I haven't been on a bicycle since I was about 72, but I think I'd ride one of those tricycles. And uh, we also thought about autistic children that might not be able to, to balance a bike. And so as part of our bike share, we got these big trikes too. And they're used. Uh, we just implemented this bike share system this uh, past April. And it's a system the private sector can tack onto a hotel or apartment complex or other business and office complex can choose and, and the system's interchangeable, uh, but uh, private sector can add on to it. There's, uh, we also have a series of uh, call uh, bike rides throughout the city with pavement markers in the streets and signage for people who just want to go on recreational rides. There's one of our in front of the city hall complex, people coming together for festivals. And it's very important to try to build a sense of community in the busy world, I think, in which we've been thrust. I want to talk for a minute or two about, and I'll make this brief, Suzanne's giving me the, the sign, but this is an important po point. We have that old county road grid. We've done something very different than any other community in the United States, and that is we've built more roundabouts. Um, and we did it as part of a system to retrofit this county road system into something that works better. I talked about as we get farther and farther out from the traditional city in these suburban cities. The roads have to be widened because sometimes the neighborhoods aren't interconnected. We do require they be interconnected, but there's all this pressure not to do that. But so much traffic out in this mile grid, and it's not enough through, not enough of a grid. And, and so we thought, how do we avoid having to widen these streets and still have a beautiful boulevards with tree canopies and keep traffic moving. These areas will eventually be redeveloped 100 years from now. They'll become denser, we know that. But now how do we retrofit them for the time being? So we knew, we started to look at Europe again. And I'd been fortunate enough to do a little bit of graduate work in, in uh, middle part of England and uh, remember the roundabouts. and. Um, I went to first consulting engineer and said, no, we're not going to build those. They're too big. People go too fast through them. And uh, they're tearing them out in New England. And I knew what I had seen in rural England was very different than what he was describing. And of course, in the United States, I, I went to an engineering library. I knew nothing about engineering. I studied history as an undergraduate. But I knew how to use a library. And I went to the engineering library, pulled some articles found the differences between roundabouts and rotaries and big circles. I was walking over in Redcliffe, the one that George criticized in front of the, uh, uh, the church over in Redcliffe. That's not a roundabout. That's a rotary. It's way too big. A modern roundabout's small. Uh, it's counterintuitive. The smaller they are, the uh, more efficient and safer they are because of slower speeds. Bicyclists are safer. Fewer pedestrian accidents, about reaction time. We know that one to four cars out of a million will crash into any intersection in every continent on Earth. Question is when that human error takes place, uh, how bad is it going to be? At a high speed, it's a lot lower. We're also saving 26,000 gallons of fuel per round about a year when contrasted to a stoplight. It's because of the momentum you're not coming to a complete stop and half the cars aren't idling at that stoplight. 
It's a huge amount of carbon savings. So we took these county roads and did a wide one lane in each direction. You see on the side, above the curb, there's a bike path or a bike road on each side. This is our standard cross section. We left 13 feet in the middle with, with very few left ability to turn left. Why did we not have to cut up that meeting so you can turn left? Because you can go to the next roundabout and do a year turn and come back. It allows us to eventually get that tree canopy. So we have tried to retrofit that old county road grid system into something that's beautiful and for the time being works better. You see the roundabout at, in the distance there. Uh, there's another example of it where the tree canopy is coming in a little faster. Um, we also don't allow off-premises signs. That's our street, our intersection with Indianapolis. Uh, you see the sign pollution. Of course, it was a cloudy day when we took the picture looking south in Indianapolis, and somehow the sun came out when we turned around and looked north from the same intersection. But that's Carmel in the north. Uh, beautiful, even though it's a major highway, uh, you can make it a greenway, make it beautiful. Uh, there's another one of our boulevards with a bike bike road along the side. We don't have these in Carmel. We prohibit in half or 20 years now unless they're hidden, built into a larger development, big boxes. That's about as bad of planning as it gets. Uh, we also try to avoid doing things like this, which have been done around the U.S. for years. Uh, the law says you have to have a sidewalk, but why not obstruct it? And then this uh, famous slide, where did I get that? Um, but I love the slide. Uh, it, it tells the story without any words of what we've become. And that is people who aren't used to walking or exercising go to a gym to do it without even realizing what we're doing. Um, here's how we hide our big boxes. There's one, uh, Dick's is a sporting goods store in the States. Uh, but we built it into a bigger development, a two-story development. Um, a very traditional look. This is, we don't do that. Can you imagine having a couple drinks and trying to find your house there on the left? Um, neighbor might be surprised. Uh, we just don't do that. We have done, uh, a, we have a lot of green fields, and we did one experiment. Uh, a, a new urbanist development was built like a town would have been built in the United States 100 years ago. Alleys or mews in the back. I'm, I'm really getting the sign from Suzanne now, so I've got to hurry. Um, I did want to show you this one. This is a gasoline station or a petrol station. We actually got them to move the gas tanks to the back of the building and the two-story buildings in front along the main street. Um, this is an abandoned service station or gas station, petrol station. The mechanic wanted to add some base to it. Uh, I convinced him to put this building up on the street. You can see the bays open to the back. Why not? You can take any building and make it nicer if you want to. And we've uh, done that. We're pretty tough on people who want to develop. Of course, uh, since we built more roundabouts than anybody in the United States, um, that was the uh, Halloween edition of the local paper. I'm being scared by a stop sign as opposed to a roundabout. Um, there's one of our larger roundabouts. Uh, you can see the uh, pedestrian path off to the left on the bottom. Pedestrians can cross. They can seek refuge in the middle, so they only have to look one way when they cross. The cars shouldn't be going more than 15 or 18 miles an hour, uh, even slower than Georgia's speed limit here. And they should be able to stop if somebody makes a mistake. Uh, at a stoplight, when someone blasts through to, through that yellow light, uh, bad things can happen. And that's one of our uh, busier roundabouts there, right when it opened. And we, there's another one. that We have a basketball tournament. Uh, among all the colleges in the United States, which is a, a big event. Uh, National Collegiate Athletic Association, you can see those initials upside down. That was the day the uh, brackets were drawn, who plays who. And I never thought, you know, look how the artist made me so short and by barely coming over the desk and never thought I was quite that fat. He, um, they had a lot of fun with the roundabouts. There's one, we show these to show the trucks can go through them. But this is unique, but it has fixed. We, so many times, and this is my point, and I'll say it and then be finished. So many times we call up that civil engineer, the reckless engineer, and I have a new name. I want that slide. The reckless engineer, and the engineer says, ah, oh, capacity problem. 
let's widen the road. What, when what really should be happening, the intersection needs to be improved. We don't need to widen the road because they do that in between all the stoplights and all they're doing is creating a bigger parking lot to get more people through the green cycle. If the intersection works better, we don't have to do that. So that's how we're retrofitting the more suburban roads in the suburban areas. And there's another bed. We did this with a major road. You can see down there at the bottom, no pedestrians ever crossed that road. There were no lights. There were no crosswalks. Uh, 70,000 cars went about 70 miles a day, uh, 70 miles per hour on that road. It would have been fatal. It divided the community in half. So instead of lowering or raising the pedestrian crossing, we made the cars go under and um, did a roundabout interchange. Um, the first day that one, we did six of them. That road runs right through the middle of the city. The uh, first day I saw someone walking along the sidewalk in the middle of the bridge reading a book while they walked. That never would have happened before. So this, my final slide, shows our guiding principles as we build this new bedroom community, uh, what we try to pay attention to. Uh, mixed use, less emphasis on use zoning, although we have architectural and other approvals. Don't care what people do with it, let the market decide that, but it's got to look nice. Uh, Pedestrian base, we design for people, not for cars. We're done doing that. We try to have a hierarchy of buildings. The public buildings ought to be like the small European village that the church always set up on the hill. We try to make sure our buildings are in harmony with the land and built surroundings. We build at a human scale. We don't like skyscrapers either. We limit our building heights to about eight stories or less. We pay a lot of attention to our enclosures, and the aesthetics, and of course, we try to get the density so that a walkable community actually works, and we try to learn, look back to Europe, and try to learn from a thousand years of good design. <laughs>